Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Pazanka and Scott Parkin. With the Green and Red podcast, and Scott is not here today. Uh, but we are, uh, as always, really happy and humbled to have with us Noam Chomsky. On January 7th, 27th, 1973, um, the United States, the uh, Democratic Republic of Vietnam, North Vietnam, the Provisional Revolutionary Government in the South, and the Republic of South Vietnam signed an agreement to end uh, U.S. participation in the Vietnam War. And so we're coming up on the, the 50th anniversary of that. And um, I think this is a period of the war that most people don't know as well as the earlier period, especially, let's say, up to Tet. So we're talking with somebody who was like deeply involved in uh, criticizing the war, protesting against the war, studying the war, writing about the war, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky. To start, um, the other day in an email, you mentioned how you found out the war had ended, and I thought it was an interesting story. So uh, if you want to tell that, to just begin. Well, that was... In 1975, Howard Zinn and I were giving one of our innumerable joint performances that happened to be at Brandeis University. We were, the two of us were giving talks against the war. And uh, in the middle of the panel, a guy raced in from the back and shouted, uh, the war's over. Uh, so. That was dramatic. <laughs> We'd both been involved in it very intensively for about 15 years. Then, I mean, the way the war is described here, even in scholarship, you know better than I do, it started in uh, 1965 when the US started bombing North Vietnam. Now, that's a convenient narrative for the United States, makes it look as though we're defending South Vietnam from North Vietnamese aggression. But the war was against South Vietnam, overwhelmingly. North Vietnam was off in the periphery, uh, but that's inconvenient for US propaganda. We're not supposed to be the kind of country that attacks and destroys and massacres other people, which is what we do. So we need some other framework. We're defending them from uh, an attack from somewhere else that's much more convenient it has nothing to do with the facts, but that's never been an impediment. Um, the war really began when John F. I mean, it goes back to 1954, when 1950, when the U.S. supported the French in their effort to reconquer their former colony. 1954, there was a settlement, international settlement. The U.S. rejected it and established a client state in the South in violation of the agreements. Next half a dozen years, about maybe 70 or 80,000 people were killed in the South under the crimes of the US-backed government. Finally, it led to resistance. Uh, then the US went to war against South Vietnam openly under Kennedy, 61 and 62, sharp escalation of the war. Uh, authorized napalm, chemical warfare, to destroy crops and livestock programs to drive uh, huge numbers of people into what amounted to concentration camps in order to protect them from the guerrillas who they were supporting, as US intelligence knew very well. Uh, US Air Force started bombing South Vietnam under South Vietnamese markings, but uh, didn't fool South Vietnamese, at least, uh, maybe Americans. But uh, that, that sharp escalation was in 61, 62, that continued and expanded right through the Kennedy years. Uh, they finally found they weren't able to control the, the US under Kennedy. When they, there was the threat of a peaceful settlement, I stress threat. The, U.S. imposed regime, the Jim regime had had enough of it, and they were looking for a settlement uh, with the North that would end it. So the Kennedy administration was quite upset about this. They organized a coup to throw them out. 
they actually got killed in the course of the coup, uh, installed a hawkish general, Marshal Key, who would follow US orders and keep the war going. That's shortly before the Kennedy assassination uh, shows, along with many other things, that Kennedy was a super hawk uh, dedicated to continuing the war until victory. He was very explicit about that. There's a whole mythology that's been constructed, but totally refuted by the evidence. I don't have to talk to you about this. I but, just had a long conversation with Jefferson Morley about this, and that, that's what I kept saying. Where's your evidence? So, yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, when you have a conclusion that you have to believe, doesn't matter what the facts are. That's well-known human weakness. Uh, but um, the framework in which it's always discussed here is a war against the North. And that completely falsifies it all the way through up to the Tet Offensive, January 1968. That was a war not against North Vietnam, but against the South, the North Vietnam. I mean, there were North Vietnamese forces, but they were at the perimeter. perimeter. They were, in fact, drawing US forces away from the center, Khe Sanh and other places. If you look at the middle, but they, we weren't fighting North Vietnam. It was a massive assault against the South, which actually won. The US uh, defeated the National Liberation Front, which was crushed by the, the Southern independent Southern forces. They were pretty much crushed. What was left was the hardliners, uh, North Vietnam and the United States. So then 73 agreement, uh, Look at the 73 agreement. It actually set up two parallel governments in South Vietnam, the US backed Saigon government and the provisional PRG, provisional revolutionary government, which was the remnants of the National Liberation Front. And they were to be parallel and equivalent. The US never accepted that. The US continued to support. Uh, Kissinger continued to support the uh, Saigon government, hoping that somehow they'd be able to hang on and US would be able to violate the Paris agreements and establish its, uh, its own government in the South. It's not the way it's portrayed, but that's what happened. And finally, it collapsed, much like the Afghan regime, Iraqi regime. I mean, it's very kind of strikingly similar to those. It's very hard to set up a mercenary army in an occupied country. Now, you can give them plenty of arms and uh, they can outweigh the opposition and armaments, but they're not going to fight that way. Like, take a look at what happened in Iraq. The United States armed and trained an Iraqi army a lot of equipment as soon as a couple of truckloads of uh, isis guerrillas came uh, racing towards them in pickup trucks uh, the officers fled and the army fled and uh, the only thing that saved iraq was iranian backed uh, shiite militias in afghanistan as soon as the us said it's pulling out whole thing collapsed uh, it's very hard to do. You can't can't really blame them. Can't get people to fight for a uh, an imposed a foreign imposed government that just doesn't work. Uh, and Vietnam was kind of like that. Well, I think it's also important because you know the the agreement is is finally signed in, in 1973, but there had been negotiations between Kissinger and Le Dateau, um in you know, 1970 and 71, where they more or less established the framework that was the final settlement. Yet the U.S. kept kind of moving that. Uh, the North Vietnamese made concessions and uh, Nguyen Van Tu kept scuttling them, you know, 69 reservations, four no's. And so, um, you know, every time this happened, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about Nixon and Kissinger's approach to this, they kind of had negotiations that came to these agreements much earlier than the war ended, and they themselves reneged on them. Yeah, 
they were forced into the agreements, always tried to evade them by seeing if more massive force, more violence could somehow keep the US client regime in place. Uh, some of the worst atrocities were in 69 and 70. The accelerated pacification campaign was called him horrendous atrocities in the South. I mean, Milai was a kind of a minor footnote to them, but uh, uh, this was all part of, and in fact, there's reasonable evidence, not proven, but plausible that Nixon and Kissinger were actually planning to use nuclear weapons if nothing else worked and were deterred by the huge popular mobilizations here in 1969, which practically blew the country up. Dan Ellsberg and others have written about this. Dan had been on the inside. He was pretty close to planning. And, uh, uh, but uh, they, they certainly never kept hoping to the last minute that they could somehow pull something out. I actually want to ask you about that, the protest and the anti-war movement as well, because you were, you were so deeply involved in that. Um, you know, some of the biggest protests occurred, you know, with Nixon, the mobilization and, and the moratorium, the, the VVAW. Um, did you see yourself getting kind of a better response by the Nixon years than you had before? Because there are a lot fewer American soldiers there. I mean, Nixon withdraws, you know, they're down to, I think, 47,000 by 1971. So when you were talking about the war, saying, hey, things are still going on, you know, it's still brutal, the Easter offensive, the, the bombing linebacker, were people listening to you or did they kind of, were they already kind of moving away because there were fewer American troops there? Well, I don't really think that was the issue. A lot of people say that. I mean, the, the, uh, the troops were withdrawn, and, but the reason was uh, the army was falling apart. Mm -hmm. The top brass wanted them out. Uh, they just weren't following orders. They were getting high on drugs, uh, shooting officers. Uh, the United States learned a lesson that all other imperial powers had known before. You don't fight a colonial war with draftees. A colonial war is murderous, brutal. You got to go in and slaughter civilians. The kids who you pick up off the streets are not going to be able to do this. So, so the army, in fact, was falling apart. The breasts really wanted them out. They were afraid the army would go. And the United States shifted at that point to what amounts to a mercenary army of the poor. It's called a volunteer army. Um, privileged young kids don't volunteer. Uh, people who have... Uh, no alternative may volunteer for whatever benefits they're getting. And also the use of straight mercenaries. We call them contractors, but they're basically mercenaries, South African killers and others. Uh, that's the British and the French style. They didn't send draftees. They used the French Foreign Legion, professional killers, uh, Gurkhas trained to be killers, you know, sea boys, uh, but uh, not uh, young French and British uh, civilians who you take out of, off the streets. It's just not, they can't fight a colonial war that way. Yeah. And the United States finally learned it and shifted to a, a professional and mercenary forces and uh, reliance on bombing from a distance and special forces who were trained for these kinds of things. That's much more the traditional imperial style. Of course, we have heavy weapons that the British and the French never had. In 1972, the kind of, I think the standard story, and if you read, like I've been reading some of the kind of 50th anniversary reflections recently, and most of them say, well, you know, the United States kind of forced the, the Northerners to, to concede through, especially through the Christmas bombings, which Roger Morris, who resigned at the time at the NLC called calculated barbarism. I think the United States was flying round the clock B-52s for 11 days in Christmas period of 1972. So we have this idea that that's, you know, that was successful, right? That that forced 
uh, the Northern Vietnamese to concede and, you know, to have basically agreed to something they'd agreed to two years earlier. But do you want to talk a little bit just about, you know, kind of the reality of what those Christmas bombings meant? Well, the reality was the hope that with sufficient force and violence, we could compel uh, the North Vietnamese to accept a, a US imposed regime in the South. Uh, the South had already been devastated. There were almost no constraints on the bombing of the South, which was much more horrifying or say the bombing of Laos. I mean, maybe the most intense in history, totally defenseless scattered population, but who cared, you know? In fact, if you look back at the bombing of Laos, Fred Branfin, the main investigator dug this out, turned out that uh, US officials conceded in Senate testimony that the reason for the bomb, intense bombing of Laos was that there was a bombing halt in North Vietnam. So they had nothing to do with the bombers. So they sent them to destroy the population of rural Northern Laos. Uh, poor peasants, half of them didn't even know they were in Laos. Uh, most intense bombing in history. I interviewed a lot of the refugees when they were driven out by a CIA mercenary army, but uh, it's a real horror story. Fred's uh, Voices from the Plains of Laos is given. Cambodia is probably even worse, but it's never been investigated. In Cambodia, 1971, uh, Kissinger transmitted, loyally transmitted the off orders from his half drunk boss. Uh, the orders were a uh, massive bombing campaign in Cambodia, anything that flies against anything that moves. I don't think you can find a call for genocide like that in the archival record. I might try, I can't find one. Anything that flies against anything that moves, that's the bombing of Cambodia. It's called a secret bombing. Yeah. not a secret to the Cambodians. Secret meaning we don't report it. That's secret. Uh, but uh, like the secret bombing of Laos and the bombing of South Vietnam, which you couldn't avoid reporting because there were troops and reporters there. But still the pretense always has been, we're fighting the North Vietnamese and defending South Vietnam from them. That's why when you look at the commentary today, we'll hear more of it in a couple of weeks at the anniversary. What it is, is the United States was engaged in a costly failed mission to bring democracy to Vietnam and to defend the South Vietnamese. That's the official line. Well, a few years ago when uh, Ken Burns did the, the PBS documentary that was so popular, you know, that was the basis of it. The United States uh, had to preserve South Vietnam, which had been invaded by North Vietnam. And, uh, you know, these were good men with the best of intentions who just made a mistake. And uh, I know even at the time, you know, the, the anti-war movement wasn't saying that. They didn't say this is a mistake and you're good guys. Well, it was kind of interesting in 1975 when the war ended, Everybody, of course, had to make a statement about it. And I published an article at the time running through the statements right to left. Uh, there, were the, there were two types, basically. There were the hawks who said, we were stabbed in the back. If we'd fought harder, we could have won. And then there were the doves. They're much more interesting. And people like, uh, at the extreme, people like Anthony Lewis of the New York Times, uh, committed left liberal commentator, the extreme in the media. Uh, his commentary was that the United States entered the war uh, with benign efforts to do good. You don't have to have evidence for that. That's a, an axiom. It's true, just like two plus two equals four. 
My dog doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> the United States did it. It was with benign intentions. But um, then he goes on to say, by 1969, it was clear that it was a disaster. We couldn't bring uh, democracy to South Vietnam at a cost acceptable to us. So that's the extreme doves. So it's between that and if we'd fought harder, we could have won. Quite interestingly, at the same time, independently, there were studies of public opinion going on. Chicago Council of Foreign Relations did, was doing intensive investigations of public attitudes on all sorts of things. And of course, they asked questions about Vietnam. 1975, 70% of the population said the war was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral. That's the American population. Uh, that remained steady for about 15 years, as long as they were asking the questions. Finally, at the end of this period, the director of the study, John really a very good social scientist, said, uh, uh, why did people keep saying that the war was fundamentally wrong and immoral? And he gave an answer. He said, because too, too many American soldiers died. Maybe, or maybe people thought it's fundamentally wrong and immoral to slaughter and destroy another country, maybe. Could have been possible to find out by asking the question, but that was never done because that couldn't be, you know. Uh, well, those are questions that haven't been explored and won't be explored. They're not the right kind. It's uh, like asking, uh, uh, did the Iraqis uh, 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 thank us for liberating them? Well, you don't ask that question because if you do, you get the wrong answers. Yeah. Um, this is also a war which has, you know, kind of the liberals, the Democrats fingerprints all over it, which I think is another piece of it that too often people today kind of forget, but Kennedy and LBJ really were the architects of the major escalation and, and, and the use of firepower. And when you, because I know you talked about that, and even in you know some of your major essays, like the responsibility of intellectuals, you talked about that. How did that go over? Because you're in Cambridge, you know, you have, you know, this is kind of the Kennedy's backyard, Mac, McGeorge Bundy, the Bundys are there. When you talked about the, the complicity of the Democrats and liberals and how they were kind of responsible for this, how how did people respond to that? You know, did did uh, you catch a lot of catch a lot of hell for that? Well, I was living in Boston at the time in Cambridge, uh, which was the center of American liberalism, probably the most liberal city in the country. We couldn't have public demonstrations against the war because they would be broken up violently, often by students in liberal Boston. It wasn't until uh, when we, we tried to have demonstrations of the Boston Common, the usual place, couldn't do that, be broken up. Uh, we tried to have them in churches. Churches were attacked. Uh, this was going on until late 1966, early 1967 began to switch. At that point, South Vietnam had practically been destroyed. You take a look at the commentary of Bernard Fall, the most respected military historian, Vietnamese specialist, the one who the US government uh, actually uh, uh, respected most. Uh, McNamara described him as the one uh, non-government sc scholar who they really had to take seriously. Uh, by the time we were able to have a demonstration in Boston, he was writing, he was a hawk himself, no dove. He was, but he cared about the Vietnamese. He was writing that Vietnam as a cultural and historical entity may not survive the most intense attack that an area this size has ever been subjected to. He was talking about South Vietnam. Well, by that point, 
with over half a million Americans. we were finally able to have a public demonstration without it being broken up. That's liberal Cambridge. Uh, then came the picture that we've already described, uh, benign intentions gone awry because of mistakes. Uh, the, uh, it was a war. We tried to protect South Vietnam from the North and couldn't manage to do it. Uh, the usual story. We'll hear more about this in a couple of weeks. It's all totally falsified. And of course, Kennedy is, is now a huge uh, public movement, mostly on the left, trying to uh, glorify Kennedy as uh, someone who really was a secret dove in his yeah. pronouncements and his actions. He was brutally hawkish, but that was just concealing the secret of within who had these hidden intentions to pull out and to move towards uh, peace and justice in the world and so on. For the past year, I've, I've been involved in this world and it's really uh, startling. I mean, there, you know, people have said, you don't understand that Kennedy was an anti-imperialist and you're defending. It's, it's, it's shocking that there's this immense uh, documentary record, what Kennedy did in Vietnam, Cuba, Africa, everywhere, Brazil, you know, Guinea, and yet they just ignore it. It's, it's stunning. Well, actually, uh, if you really look at Kennedy seriously, probably the most, aside from Vietnam, the most dangerous things he did were in our backyard, Latin America. Mm -hmm. In 1962, uh, Kennedy, shifted the mission of the Latin American military, which we of course control, shifted their mission from hemispheric defense, which was a relic from the Second World War, shifted it to internal security. Well, in Latin America, internal security means something. It means, I'll give the description that was given by Kennedy's uh, chief of counterinsurgency, Charles Maechling, said this was a shift from uh, tolerating the rapacity and brutality of the Latin American military to direct and active participation in crimes of the kind that uh, were carried out by Himmler's uh, uh, Gestapo. That's Kennedy's chief of counterinsurgency which is a pretty fair description of what happened. Right after that started a wave of military dictatorships, supported, backed, sometimes instituted by the United States. First one was Brazil, planned during the Kennedy administration, took place right after the assassination. Uh, the greatest victory for freedom in the mid 20th century, according to Kennedy's ambassador, neo-Nazi torture, regime, wonderful. He also added, it's very good for American investment, which is true, it was. Then comes Uruguay, Chile, Pinochet, Argentina, a whole raft, Central America, under Reagan, um, decades of horrifying atrocities. Well, was set off by the 1962 decision. And uh, see, <laughs> You, you have a you have a conservative dog. <laughs> Maybe it's criticism. I'm not sure. <laughs> They're not very precise about it. <laughs> Hi, you're watching and listening to the Green and Red podcast. And today we're talking with Noam Chomsky about the uh, 50th anniversary of the peace treaty that ended the Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam is one of our big interests here. And we've been at the forefront, uh, especially on the public interest given to the JFK conspiracy theories. So if you like this and other shows on radical history and politics, please subscribe uh, to us on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow Green and Red uh, on Linktree slash Green and Red podcast. And we also have a web page, which gives you lots of information. And that's at Green and Red 
greenandredpodcast.org. If you want to support us, the Green and Red Podcast, you can become a patron uh, for whatever amount you want uh, at uh, patreon.com slash greenredpodcast. Or you can make a one-time donation um, uh, from our webpage. Hit the support button. Uh, Green and Red has also just become a member of the uh, Labor Podcast Network. And you can check that out at laborradionetwork.org. So uh, now we'll get back to our interview with Noam Chomsky. But, uh, and this, you know, take, say, Cuba. I mean, Cuba, uh, Kennedy tried an invasion. When that failed, the Kennedy administration just went crazy. Uh, they launched a major terrorist war, not discussed here, but it was a serious terrorist war, uh, harsh sanctions to punish Cuba from uh, resisting the U.S. invasion. Can't do that kind of thing. In fact, the State Department back in the 60s said uh, the problem of Castro is, uh, the threat of Castro is Cuba's successful defiance of U.S. policies going back to the 1820s. Monroe Doctrine declared our intention to dominate the hemisphere. Can't have successful defiance of that. So a major terrorist war, harsh sanctions, strangling the society, goes on right up till today. Got to punish those things. Cubans need syringes for vaccines, we're going to prevent Europe from sending them to them, because if they do, we'll punish Europe with their control of the international financial system. Uh, let's go straight back to the Kennedy years. No change. In fact, Clinton was one of the worst. Oh, I'm, yeah. Um, the, the Cubans have always kind of thanked the Vietnamese. They said, you know, if it weren't for Vietnam, we would have probably been receiving those attacks from the United States. Why do you think, I mean, it, it could have happened in, in the post-45 era, as you pointed out, the United States was involved everywhere from Greece to Indonesia, Iran, Guatemala, you name it, you know, the, the Middle East. Why do you think Vietnam became the place where it actually fought this huge war, you know, where it didn't do that in other places? What was the importance of Vietnam in, in their minds? Well, the importance of Vietnam was didn't succumb. So Guatemala, uh, under Eisenhower, uh, the U.S. threatened and initiated an invasion and they collapsed over. Iran, under Eisenhower, overthrew the government. Uh, Indonesia was a little tougher. Uh, Eisenhower tried in 1958 to intervene in Indonesia to destroy the parliamentary government, institute a military regime, but it failed. It wasn't until 1965 when uh, General Suharto carried out a military coup, support of the United States, uh, slaughtered, nobody knows how many, maybe a million people, uh, destroyed the main political party. It was greeted with euphoria in the United States. New York, it was described accurately. New York Times described it as a staggering bloodbath. Uh, Time magazine devoted a whole issue to the bloody massacre. We're all praising it. Uh, hope where there once was none, you know, gleam of light in Asia, New York Times, James Restman, because it opened the country, it destroyed an independent uh, government that was not following orders, and it opened the place up to U.S. investment and exploitation. So the fact that they, and this went on uh, when Suharto visited Washington in 1995, Clinton, he was welcomed as uh, Clinton said, our kind of guy, you know, slaughters and tortures and opens the place up to uh, U.S. investment. Uh, Vietnam was different, didn't succumb. So it got out of hand. After 
let's say, Tad, it was pretty clear that the United States probably wasn't going to succeed in Vietnam, yet it continued fighting. It, it uh, significantly escalated the air war, including in, in Laos and, and Kampuchea. Um, and people like Frank Snap, who was a CIA agent, said they, they wanted a decent interval before they lost, right? Others have suggested the United States just wanted to inflict maximum damage on Vietnam so that, you know, even if it did win, it really couldn't rebuild. And uh, I just wondered what, what, why you think the United States continued after it was fairly clear that they weren't going to, to succeed militarily. Well, there is what Dan Ellsberg called the quagmire theory. He was on the inside for most of this period, right at the top of the planning. He said, once you're in, you just can't get out, you lose credibility, you know. And in fact, some of the top uh, officials said that, like John McNaughton, McNaughton. Up, McNaughton. Kind of, 80% of the reason we're here is it'll look bad if we get out, you know. Yeah. So maybe that's part of it. But I think at least on the part of Henry Kissinger, Nixon was probably too drunk to know what was going on. But Kissinger was functioning and uh, seems that he thought that the U.S. could still somehow manage to install a client regime. And that's why uh, he uh, did not accept the 73 agreements, but insisted that the South Vietnamese government was the Saigon government, was the sole legitimate government of South Vietnam. 73 agreements said there are two parallel governments. PRG and Saigon, uh, Kissinger never accepted that. So it looks as if maybe it was a decent interval, that's standard line, or maybe it was a hope that maybe he could get more if he kept fighting. The, the agreement the United, United States meant very remote, meant bombing, right. not, you know, didn't cost us anything. The agreement also included provisions on, on what would happen after the treaty was signed. And um, again, that the American story, which I think the media picked up, was that the, the Vietnamese were violating the agreement when in fact the United States was continuing to send weapons and, and all kinds of funding, right, to, uh, to the Southerners. Yeah, the United States and North Vietnam violated the agreements. South Vietnam, which was the target of the attack, they were not even part of it. I think it's it's striking. Um, there's a good site which has maps of, of the Vietnam War, and one of the maps is bombing runs in Vietnam. A huge uh, majority, I think close to two-thirds of the attacks occurred below the 17th parallel. So the United States was attacking its so-called ally, which I've never seen before in military history, where you attack you know, the country you're there to save. It was almost all in the South, the worst. Yeah. I mean, the saturation bombing of heavily populated areas by B-52s that was in the South, deep in the South, in fact, Mekong Delta or in Quang, Quang Nai province, you know, smashed. Uh, I mean, North Vietnam was bad enough. I visited and it was pretty bad, but uh, nothing like South Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia, which is, I mean, around Hanoi, the United States was not able to bomb too intensively because there are foreign embassies, uh, European embassies, people watching. Uh, in 1970, the Christmas bombings broke that barrier, but before that they had been, I mean, I, I was in North Vietnam in 1970. When you were in Hanoi, you could see the effects of bombing, but as soon as you went into the countryside, it turned into moonscapes. When you visited Vietnam and, and returned, did anybody try to talk to you? Any any kind of officials or uh, you know, kind of any any secret doves? You know? It was kind of interesting. I uh, Cora Weiss, who was one of the major people in the international peace movement, and was keeping international contacts with the Vietnamese and others, 
uh, she called me up one evening and said, look, uh, would you be able to go to North Vietnam to visit during a bombing pause? So I, I said, I'd work it out. About an hour later, I got a call from the State Department saying, can we help you with your trip to North Vietnam? Oh. And what they were after was if they, the good guys help out with everything. Then when we come out, they can brief, we can, they can brief us and we'll tell them about North Vietnam, obviously what they wanted. But they were very helpful. They said, yes, please let us help you in every way. And uh, I didn't exactly know why I was being invited. It turned out that they wanted me to lecture at the, uh, what the ruins of the Polytechnic University. They hadn't had, the, everyone was been scattered out to the countryside for years and they wanted to hear what's going on in any field I knew the slightest thing about. Like one guy asked me, uh, what's Norman Whaler writing these days? You know, <laughs> <laughs> but one of the interesting things there was, uh, it has to do with U.S. planning. I did meet with the higher-ups in the Politburo, uh, some of the top people, Huang Tung, others. They made it very clear and explicit that their enemy was not the United States, it was China. They said, yes, you guys are smashing us to pieces, but you're going to go away. China's not going to go away. Nobody in the higher planning level in the United States could ever understand that. I mean, it's obvious why. It's become obvious in the post-war period, but had to be what Dean Russ called the Sino-Soviet conspiracy. Well, Russia and China were practically at war, and Vietnam didn't want either of them. You know, they were the enemy. In fact, the first day I was there, I went with Doug Dodd and Dick Fernandez. Uh, the three of us were taken to a war museum in Hanoi. We were subjected to a three hour lecture on the wars that Vietnam had fought against China a thousand years ago, telling us very clearly, that's what we're worried about they're going to still be there when you go away. If any top American planner had had the brains to understand this, they would have treated the whole thing totally differently. But this is such an ideologically rigid country that you just have to stick within the framework of official propaganda, no matter what's staring you in the face. We're seeing it right now with the insane Russophobia but it's common. Yeah, I've been thinking about that to, to discuss negotiating with, with Russia. Um, and, you know, again, you have a lot of establishment figures doing that. It reminded me of people like Morgenthau and Kennan in the Vietnam era, but you're, you're labeled a, a puppet of Putin and, and all that kind of stuff. And it really, although now you're starting to see like Mark Milley, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, even saying, okay, we have to negotiate, but yeah, yeah it's, it's incredibly rigid. That's okay. true. In fact, if it's interesting that if you read Foreign Affairs, Main Establishment Journal, mm -hmm. they're running pretty conciliatory articles mm -hmm. that people on the left could never get away with. Right. Not right. just let's negotiate, but let's, uh, there was a recent article by uh, Vladimir Zubak saying, well-known specialist. That's, that's a good piece, yeah. We don't really have to negotiate, yeah. but we have to, integrate Russia back into the international system as a participating, equally participating member because it's just too important for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you and I tried to say that, it would be killed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Zubak is pretty good. I've always, I read him for a long time and he's always helpful and enlightening. You, you mentioned China a minute ago, and I think this is important too, because again, you know, this is not really kind of part of the American history of it, but you know, in 1979, with Carter and Brzezinski's encouragement, um, the Chinese invaded Vietnam. And, yeah. and again, I, you know. <laughs> punish, punish Vietnam for driving out the Khmer Rouge. Yes. The US was 
tacitly supporting the Khmer Rouge at the time. And Hewitt Carter and Brzezinski supported a Chinese invasion to punish Vietnam for driving them out of Cambodia, ending the atrocities. In fact, the United States then went on to support the basically the Khmer Rouge government had a different name at the time, Democratic Kampuchea, support them as the representatives of the Cambodian people. They had the position in the United Nations, which the US supported. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, also the US was turning to uh, helping them regroup and rearm and so on. That's, uh, that went on for a couple of years, well into the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. Jean Kirkpatrick uh, defended them at the at the UN. I remember that. Um, and, you know that speaks a lot to the kind of post-war Vietnam. I know Gabriel Coco has written a lot about this. Who was you know a, very active and and you know visited Vietnam frequently. But he wrote really critically of them. Uh, uh, you know after the war ended, now they have these massive occupation costs in, in Kampuchea. They have this war against Vietnam. But I think one of the first things it sounds like they did was to kind of abandon. The people who made the revolution possible, the workers, the veterans, and you know um, they couldn't get IMF. I mean, the United States continued the war, right? It it, it reneged on a, a reparations agreement that was in a codicil that Nixon had, had made. Uh, it prevented the IMF and World Bank and other uh, international institutions from helping Vietnam out. So, what was the situation like there in the '80s after the war? It sounds uh, it was it was fairly bleak and desperate. Yeah, uh, Gabe Kalka is a very good historian and knew Vietnam very well. He was very critical of them, but my feeling is he somewhat misunderstood the uh, Vietnamese from the beginning. I mean, they were not uh, libertarian socialists. They were tough. Mm -hmm. They were going to run a tough state under their control uh, and uh, the fact that they, it wasn't a working class revolution. It was a popular defense against attack and the uh, leadership I don't think had any dedicated socialist ideals, not in my view, uh, but uh, they fought a war to defend themselves and to gain power what they did afterwards. The main popular forces in Vietnam, in my opinion, were the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, which was destroyed. North Vietnam didn't want them, the United States didn't want them. And uh, they were the, virtually nothing survived of them. Uh, when the war ended, we kept hearing that there was now a Vietnam syndrome and the United States was not going to do this kind of thing anymore. It was going to abandon these kind of colonial projects, um, you know. And and yet, you know, here we are today with this massive in in uh, investment in Ukraine and saber rattling against China and all kinds of other stuff. You know, before that century, if if there were so called lessons of, of Vietnam for the United States, you know, what do you think they were? Well, the lesson for the United States was quite clear. First, what we already talked about, you don't use a civilian army to fight colonial wars. Second lesson, don't get involved in massive troop commitments. Fight your wars on the cheap. Uh, take, say, the Ukraine war. For the United States, it's just a, a blessing for a small fraction small fraction of the US defense budget. Uh, we're practically destroying the army of our major opponent, Russia. Uh, the major military opponent is Russia. Uh, a lot of their military forces, uh, uh, soldiers, uh, armaments are being destroyed for a tiny cost to us. I mean, a big cost in Ukrainian lives, but who cares about that? Uh, the US policy quite officially is got to keep fighting the war to severely weaken Russia. Well, we're doing that. We're severely weakening Russia. 
if Ukraine is devastated, it's kind of collateral damage. Uh, but uh, people starving in Africa, well, what can you do about that? And yeah, man. Uh, yeah. The war going uh, severely, and it's it's on the cheap. Mm -hmm. It's a very small expenditure, and the U.S. Uh, interventions in the following years uh, were basically little cost to the United States, plenty of cost, overthrow the government of Chile and put in a murderous, brutal dictatorship. It's a benefit to the United States investment, uh, yeah. take over the economy and so on. It doesn't cost anything. We've been going on, so I appreciate your time. Um, just a couple more things. One, and this is something you brought up, and I've since written about, and really probably got a different view of it. Like the neocon intellectuals, like uh, Norman Podhoretz, uh, talk about it as, in his words, the sickly inhibition against the use of military force. We got to get over that sickly inhibition. <laughs> Which really never, I mean, they use proxies, but that, that's the thing I, I've often argued. There really was no Vietnam syndrome, you know, uh, that didn't really stop anybody. One of the things you've written and I've written about, and I catch hell for it, but I, I think you're right, is you've kind of argued that the United States kind of won the war, right? Uh, you know, 50 years later. What do you mean by that? The United States, you know, didn't, it didn't win the war in 1973, obviously, but if you look at Vietnam today, you know, how, why would you say that the United States kind of achieved many of its objectives there? Well, I've been kind of a maverick on this as on a lot of other things. Yeah. I thought the U.S. had won the war by 1970s. Um, if you look back at the early documents when the war was being planned, early 50s, the Truman administration, we have the documentary record. And they're pretty clear about it. They say it's, uh, Atchison put it, uh, if you have one rotten apple, it can spoil the barrel. You know, if Vietnam becomes independent and successful, it'll affect Thailand, it'll affect Burma, might even affect Indonesia, which has rich resources. They were concerned it might go all the way to Japan. What, um, historian John Dower, Asia historian, called the super domino. Japan might agree to, as they put it, to accommodate with an independent Asia becoming its technological industrial center and having a resource area in Southeast Asia. But what's that? That's Japan's new order. That's what the fascist regime in Japan was trying to construct. In the early 1950s, the United States was not ready to lose the Pacific War, which is what it came down to. So you have to stop it at its core. Uh, the way Kissinger put it later, you have to prevent the, stop the virus that's spreading infection. Well, the virus at that point was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We stopped it. Vietnam's not going to be a model for anybody. Meanwhile, in the surrounding areas, starting in the early 50s, the United States uh, imposed brutal dictatorships in state after state, didn't make it to Indonesia until 1965. But the whole region, um, also that's true of the background of the military regime in Burma, when George Kahn wrote about this, uh, the, uh, Great scholar. Uh, so you want to stop a virus from spreading contagion, you kill the virus, and you inoculate the potential victims with military dictatorships. It was done by 1970s. That was all in place. So the initial objectives of the United States had been achieved. Uh, they didn't achieve the maximal objective of turning Vietnam into uh, Pinochet's Chile, but uh, got the basic um, the basic goals were were achieved. Mm -hmm. I must say, I was never able to convince even friends like Marilyn Young, great Vietnam historian, couldn't believe any of this. But I think it's if you look at the 
actual documentary record. I think that's pretty much what happened. No, I, I wrote a piece along those lines a few years ago and kind of caught hell for it. So that, that's your fault. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's uh, so we're, we're, you know, kind of coming up on the 50th anniversary and I'm already starting to see some media, uh, which is kind of, you know, saying, you know, kind of yeah, the, the truth whole story. It was it was a noble cause and, you know, Nixon bombed them into the peace table and blah, blah, blah. When when you think of, you know, when people ask about the 50th anniversary, what do you think we should think about what, what should we remember you know uh, 50 years later about this this long and bloody uh, u.s um invasion of of a, a small country uh, having a national liberation movement i think we should think about the reasons the reasons are what i described you can't allow a virus to accept mm -hmm. to spread infection it's ridiculed as the domino theory, but it's a perfectly sensible theory. Mm -hmm. It's the theory that was held by imperialist states forever. You know, In fact, the American Revolution in the 18th century was regarded that way by European statesmen. Metternich and the rest said this is dangerous. Uh, the danger of republicanism could spread around the world and undermine our controls. It's perfectly rational. So the U.S. was simply taking it over and pursued it with extreme savagery, expanding radically under Kennedy, reshaping the narrative as if it was a war to defend South Vietnam from the North, whereas in fact it was a war against the South all the way through and against Laos and Cambodia. Uh, which were smashed, and the U.S. basically did destroy the nationalist movements. Left under conditions like that, only the harshest people survive. Well, they survived. Now we can say, look, we were right, because look how harsh they are. Yeah, those are the ones who survive attack, brutal attacks. Well, I think we should rethink all of this. What I expect to see is something like the farce we just saw it at Harvard. Yeah. They ran a, on Iraq. They ran a debate, a serious debate, as to whether the Iraq invasion qualifies as humanitarian intervention. I mean, suppose we saw a debate in Moscow as to whether Russia's invasion of Ukraine qualifies as humanitarian intervention. I mean, we collapse and ridicule. When we see it at Harvard, we say, oh, how thoughtful. Um, Samantha Power moderated it. Uh, wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. I suspect we'll see something like that. Well, Harvard also just uh, rejected uh, somebody for a dean's position because he uh, spoke about Palestinian human rights. So, Well, that's how, interestingly how it came out. Uh, Ken Roth, who was uh, refused an appointment at Harvard was praised for having taken the negative position in that debate. Uh, he said, no, it didn't qualify as humanitarian intervention. I, mean, I can't imagine even participating in a discussion like that. Yeah. But with that, I think we're going to hear things like that about Vietnam, probably. Incidentally, the 20th anniversary of the Iraq invasion is also coming up, so we'll probably get a one-two punch on this. Yeah, be interesting to look at for those mm -hmm. interested in how depraved ideological yeah. fanaticism can become. When I started studying Vietnam a while ago, you know, I think there was a, a consensus, you know, a very negative criticism of it. And I, I, you know, it's certainly kind of been rehabilitated significantly since then. So I appreciate that you've among others, but, you know, uh, continue to, to talk, you know, speak about it in, in these, in these, you know, realistic ways based on evidence, based on the record. But uh, yeah, as a historical episode, I, I find it quite distressing. It is, but there have been good signs. The American population is much more opposed to aggression than it was oh, yeah. years ago. I mean, we saw that in the invasion of Iraq, mm -hmm. they, 
were huge protests on president even before the invasion was launched. A big difference from Vietnam, mm -hmm. where, as I said before, you couldn't even have a public demonstration about it for years in liberal cities like Boston. That's a, that's a change. As always, you know, I could talk to you forever. Um, I appreciate this so much. I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about this because I know there's going to be a lot of media attention and I wanted to kind of present a different point of view about it. And I know Scott and I are also going to do another show on this uh, to talk about it, you know, to try to kind yeah. of, you know, throw our hat in struggle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you're used to that. <laughs> hey, it's no fun to be in the, I've never been in the majority, so I wouldn't know, but I don't think, I think it's more fun to, to kind of That's be, right. you know. Uh, but I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, this has been fantastic and, and I'm sure, you know, there'll be a lot to talk about in the next coming weeks. So I, I really wanted to, to make this contribution to it on the, on the green and red podcast. So I really appreciate it. And, and thank you so much as always. So it's, it's been great talking. My pleasure. Yeah. Glad to know you're doing this. Uh, if you like interviews like the one we've just done with Noam Chomsky and other shows on radical history and politics, uh, please subscribe to us on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform. You can follow Green and Red at uh, Linktree slash Green and Red Podcast. And check out our webpage at greenandredpodcast.org. If you want to support us, uh, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash greenredpodcast. Or you can make a one-time donation by going to the webpage and clicking on the support button. And we've also just become a member of the Labor Podcast Network, and you can check that out at laborradionetwork.org. So thanks, uh, as always, for uh, supporting us at Green and Red Podcast, and um, have a great day, and we'll see you soon.